Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word and sacrament this morning. Um, especially gift us with your word that with it we would be able to rebuke every temptation. Grant a uh, blessing of the Holy Spirit through the study of your word um, as we study your revelation now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Revelation chapter 17. There's so many good treats up there. I have to take a break for a bite. Um, but um, again, it's always hard to jump back in, but that's what we just have to do. But we're in the midst of um, these, uh, these seven bowls were just poured out uh, by seven angels, sort of these bowls of wrath. We see um, sort of a, uh, reminds us of the plagues in Egypt, certainly come to mind, but uh, against especially who, not those who have been marked with the mark of the lamb, the cross we might say, but those that have been with the mark of the beast. So judgment against unbelief um, and, and idolatry. And so now, in the context of all that, let's just jump right into chapter 17. Um, let's see. Chris, when you're ready, would you pick up and do 1 through 6, please? Chapter 17, verse 1 through 6. 1 through 6. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup, full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Thank you. So, you know, it actually lines up really well with some of our scripture today. I think it was... It was in our psalm, yeah, not putting out our trust in princes or kings. But what do the kings of this world do? They go after power uh, and they go after their own passions, especially, you know, we would think of lust. And so uh, we have this, this woman, this um, sort of scarlet woman of, of Babylon who sort of represents everything that the world would chase, everything that mankind would chase when following their own desires. Um, and this is directly in conflict with the faithful. There's no neutral ground. So much so that it, it, you think of King, um, sorry, Elijah and King uh, Ahab, right? Am I saying that? Yes. It's Ahab and Jezebel, right? What happens when the prophet goes up and brings God's word against the indulging king? He doesn't just push. No, he hates it. And he wars against it. What happens to the faithful when the kings of the world try to shut them up and they don't stop? They put them to death. So that's what we see here. This woman, this thing that the, the, the kings of the world, kings of the earth are um, attaching themselves to in adultery uh, is drunk with the blood of the saints. I mean, the depravity of it all. Please, go ahead, Dave. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I... Again, there's so much symbolism in the book. Yes. But, you know, the Lord kindly gives us insight. Like in, in chapter one with the seven stars. Right. And the seven lamps. And he tells us what those are. Mm -hmm. Well, here at the end of chapter 17, it says, and the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Yeah. So we know in the first century there were many, many martyrs in Rome. Right, yeah. Paul, Peter, uh, I, I don't know how many. Oh, yeah. Countless. I mean, you could count it, but I mean, numerous, numerous, right? Um, 
Yeah, and so Rome certainly is kind of like the archetype of this, and I think it's in general where power concentrates itself. We see this to be true. Um, that's what we do with power. Again, to look at the example even of King David. Look at King David and King Solomon. They're, how great it is, and yet when they have all this power, what do they do with it? You know, thanks be to God, we have the law, and if nothing else, out of fear of the law, we don't follow our desires sometimes. But when you think you can get away with it because you're king, you suddenly don't really have the law as a threat. When you have power, what do you do? You abuse it because you can get away with it. That's what our sinful flesh wants. So that's why we're thankful for the law, even though we should want to do things out of love. We're thankful that laws exist, both earthly laws, also God's eternal law to restrain our sinful flesh, even if we're still sinful, at least protects our neighbor, protects Uriah so he doesn't have to die for King David wanting to cover up his sin. That's what the law is for us. Um, but that's, yeah, that's the city of the world versus the city of God, the city of peace, the city of righteousness. Let's, let's just keep reading because, yeah, it's going to comment as you, as you mentioned. So, uh, Lorna, if, you would, if you're open to reading, if you would do... Uh, I think it, I don't know if it's split in the middle of six, but uh, seven through uh, 14. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eight, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to, to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. I mean, that's all easy enough to understand, right? You got all of it. <laughs> yeah, kind of a lot there. Um, in general, you can sort of see the thrust of what's happening. It's the particulars that are fascinating, right? Where it mentions these specific numbers. And you have all this language that comes up both about God in one sense, but also about these things, the who was and is and is to come and whatnot, right? It's like, okay, what is, what is going on here? And that's why it says that verse 9, this calls for a mind with wisdom. But it does tell us some of it. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Well, okay, that's helpful. I mean, it is and it isn't, right? But then 10. So the, the, the fact that there are seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, and another has not yet come. So something yet to come. And as for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth but belongs to the seven. Boy, so head scratching, right? Comments, questions, uh, Katie, and then I'll come to Dave. You can help me if I'm wrong. Oh boy! <laughs> can I so can I quote you on that? <laughs> one time. Um, so was and is not. It's kind of like what I thought of is that Satan has power, but in the end, it's almost like nothing. Kind of. Right. Well, it will not last. Right. Yeah. yeah it's, it's also Right, yeah, absolutely. I think I think there's a sense to that. Um, yeah. Uh, Dave, go ahead, please. Well, in the context of the book, yeah. we, we go back to chapter 13, and it talks about the beast, and it, ha it has a fatal wound to the head. Right. And 
whatever organization or, or government or whatever that this comes out of, mm -hmm. it seems like, you know, that this beast that says he was one of the seven but was, all, was also on the eight, well, something happens, and I think it was that fatal wound. He was a king, and now he's the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's what it's getting at. Yeah, that it, it's mind-boggling because you know it sounds like he died, right? He got a fatal wound, right? But <coughs> he's come up out of the abyss, and and I can't help but think. So you, you hear that language? To me, this sounds like what we know about Satan now. So the crucifixion has happened. He is defeated. Death, where is your sting? Death mm -hmm. has been swallowed up by death, and yet. We also know right now he still has some power and still has a, is a threat to us. That, that comes to mind in all of this. I think that's kind of, and it goes to Katie's point about, well, he was, and in a sense is not, and yet he is around. Yeah, it's tough to wrap the mind around all this, isn't it? And yet just kind of think plainly, what do we know? We know there's still the threat, but for us who trust make the Lord our refuge, there is nothing to fear. He is defeated. It is a fatal wound. All of these, those last verses are really good though. The third, verse 13. These are of one mind, all of these kings, the power, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, but the lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. Out of order for the hallelujah chorus, right? I want to say King of Kings and Lords of Lords. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Oof, okay, good. We're good to go. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, well, again, we have more information on the woman. Yeah. That she's seated on seven mountains and that there are seven hills that Again, that seems to point to Rome because we know Rome is seated on seven hills. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it's interesting because at the time that this was written and Rome was in power, yeah, the name Rome would, you know, maybe result in yeah being put to death. Right. But, you know, the description seems to be pretty clear. Yeah, so you're getting at this idea of part of the beauty of this book and it's the, when it was first, you know, being distributed was it was in code for like you said, so you could maybe read this and not just be blatantly, uh, you know, heretics to the Roman Empire, right? Um, so the beauty of this is yeah, for us, we're sitting here like, okay, what does seven mountains mean? Well, as Dave pointed out, we sort of need some historical context. For them at that time, it wasn't hard. A lot of this was clear. So that's why in a way, you've maybe picked up on, I don't get too deep into details. And the reason why is I can tell you all this and then tomorrow you're going to forget. And the next time you read it, we're going to have to go through it again. So not to say it's not important, but sadly, we just don't have those cultural... Uh, we don't have the clues that they would have had at this time. And yet, um, um, it would have been amazing. Yeah, because we're reading this and it's about the past. But to have been there as this is being distributed to Christians and realize some of this is a present, very present reality, I cannot imagine. And I think, the, I think what we can do is we can kind of project Rome into the empires of today to some or less extent. Um, again, what does Rome really represent but the spirit of man, especially led astray uh, by the evil one? So it manifests itself in various ways. Um, just because it's short, I'll read at 15 to finish out the chapter. And, and the angel said to me, again, verse 15, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated, are peoples and multitudes and na nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. 
For God has put into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the word of God, words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Now doesn't that seem strange when it talks about them hating the prostitute? What are your reactions to that? Anything? Yeah. Well, again, trying to stay in the context of the book. Yeah. Um, if, in my own thinking, sure. you know, in Daniel chapter 9, we have the 70th week of Daniel, which is seven years of tribulation. So that seems in the book of Revelation to be divided in half for the first three and a half years. Mm -hmm. The two witnesses are prophesying for only 60 days. And then for 42 months, the, the, the beast has its power. Mm -hmm. And he is... You know, again, going back to Second Thessalonians chapter two, yeah, he, he proclaims himself God Almighty, and so that he has no competition, he hates the woman who apparently is the center of a godless religion yeah. for the world, right, and. He wants no competition because he's declaring himself to be God Almighty. So he and the ten kings that follow him destroy the great one, the, the great city, mm -hmm. the, the woman, and and that's all in accord with God's will because God hates the woman as well. Yeah. Because of, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Blasphemous, blasphemous names, you know, full of the abominations of, of the earth. Yeah. Did you have a comment, Katie, or a question? Yeah, I think um, I kind of had to back up what she said when Satan wants no competition. I, I took it as like he just used whoever he's using to get there. Yeah, I think there's an aspect of that for sure. Is that what you were going to say? Back there, you're nodding. Yeah. And I think there's a. I think there's a lesson in that for when we do fall astray. I kind of mentioned that in the sermon. You know, we seek the passions of this life and it seems more comfortable. And maybe immediate gratification makes that true. And yet, long term, it will catch up with us. And so that's kind of what we see um, in general. God often works, oftentimes he has the wicked eat the wicked. And they kind of... You know, live by the sword, die by the sword. Sometimes it's, you know, maybe an angel of God sends, but sometimes he just works through the wicked to eat up. You know, the wicked are eaten up by the the new wicked that comes. So, yeah, I think so absolutely there. Um, Satan will not actually reward us in the end. Yeah. We got into a discussion the woman literally as like you said the desires of the world <clears throat> we were talking about well we're kind of occurring on now um, they're trying to squelch desires um, in the name of saving the planet and um, that, so they're kind of turning against that but it's not really toward God it's they're more yeah worshiping the creator Sure. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think there could be a way to spin that for sure. Um, but yeah, Matt, go ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. But when you get to the heart of them, of course, they're all false. Yeah. You look at somebody, you look at like the, the Muslims or you look at like, um, uh, like Buddhists and who are outwardly very, very pure. Yeah, right. But, you know, it, it, it's a false 
Yeah, no, that's a good point. Because you're right, in, in, a, in a moral, in a strictly moral sense, they're sort of above reproach, you know, for the most part or whatnot. But, <laughs> but, it, but it, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, it does lead astray. I mean, um, I mean, the big thing with any of those is the, the, idea, the lack of grace. So what I mean, with, with Islam, it is a religion of works, no question. They wouldn't even... They wouldn't even scoff at that if we accuse them of that. They'd say, yeah. Um, and then you think with, with it, Buddhism or anything with enlightenment, the idea is trying to become enlightened yourself, which there's sort of a an arrogance behind. I don't know. I wouldn't try to speak for them. But it kind of points back to self either way. And that's kind of what we try to articulate is uniquely um, – what our grace is. Uh, Dave, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, keep no, you waiting. That's, that's fine. Uh, well, again, you know, we I mentioned this to you that back in September that oh, yeah. that the Pope had the, joined forces with yeah. the Islamic leaders and this is starting to take a foothold in this country. Chrislam, yeah, yeah. cross between Christianity and Islam. Yeah. And here Rome is the heart of this. Yeah, Again, yeah. the great city. And yeah. that is abominable in the sight of the Lord. It, That's just horrible. And it's, 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 you know, we call it historical happenstance, call it what was meant to happen, but it, it is funny that the Catholic Church is seated in Rome. I mean, now in their eyes, maybe they see it as sort of a redemption. <laughs> and at the end of the day, well, it doesn't matter what city they're actually in, but it, it is kind of like, ooh. Because there's especially the problem there is, is, is the, and again, that's why I brought up a couple weeks ago that at the time of the Reformation, they saw the papacy as the Antichrist, the thing standing in place of Christ. And to your point, when if any of these steps are happening where they are, comp, where one leader is compromising the largest, I believe it's the single largest denomination, if you will, I guess. Of Christianity in the world, whoa, that's scary. So, um, yeah, it does make you wonder. And because I, I, I bring up the idea that there's no neutral ground, but that's I, I like that you brought that up, Matt, because it does seem like okay. Well, wait a second. There does seem to be false religions that do seem to want to be moral. Um, but at the end of the day, they're being led astray still. And I would, and I would argue it does point back to self at some point, trusting in self. Yeah, Katie. They're also, they also pick and choose their morals. What happens when they break a moral? There's no forgiveness. Yeah. With a lot of, that's right. That's, uh, right. as I say, we can be careful to overgeneralize, but yeah. And, and, and really, um, you know, what? So we like morality because it's plain to see. So, you know, someone doesn't believe in Jesus, but they seem to be a nice person. I don't mean that in the cheese way. Oh, they're a nice person. No, I mean like they legitimately seem caring, loving, whatnot. And you see that. But what does Jesus say is the greatest commandment when they ask him? Love the Lord your God. I mean, without that, everything else is flawed. Because where else do we learn what love is? Then he does say love your neighbor as yourself. And certainly... To some extent, you maybe could argue that other people could have as good of morals outwardly in a sense with that, but they're missing the first part. That's so critical. So, um, however, it shakes out to kind of your point, Katie. I think there there ends up being something that they miss. Uh, no question. Um, no good, good comments. Good, good thoughts there. All right, well, let's jump into chapter 18. Um, the, the, the Bible I use, it's an ESV, but it has very limited markings. But it does, there might be three markings in all of Revelation, but it does signify here that this is the part where Christ triumphs and ushers in the new earth. So you're, you might have some headings here. It doesn't, doesn't matter. But let's just jump right into chapter 18. Uh, Dave, if you'd like to read, if you would do, uh, why don't you do one through eight, please? <clears throat> After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, 
having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a, a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the, of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich in the power of her subjurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her, sin, her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her, her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double uh, for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she, she mixed, as she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, so give her, a, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, "I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning, I shall never see." For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine. And she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Yeah, she's not having a good time. <laughs> um, and I, I think what's great about this is this emphasis on what this is what is the result. You want to chase these things, fine. Go ahead, get your immediate gratification. But where will this all end up? And so it starts with the woman, but then in a way we know it won't end with her. It's not just for her. Um, yeah. Or if you if you used her and then you cast her aside, where do you think you're headed? Yeah. Yeah, well... I know when we went through Galatians, you know, Paul was talking about the gospel that was given him by the Lord Jesus, and he said, uh, even though we are an angel from heaven, yeah. should preach to you gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And that would cover every religion outside of Christianity. You bet. You know, perversion of the truth. You bet. And that's abominable in the sight of God, and God says it's a curse. Yeah. So you, you, you're bringing that up kind of in light of what we were talking about before. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah, the abomination of, and, of the world. Yeah. And God hates that. Yeah. Boy, we would, you can imagine how easy it would be to fall for something like that, though. Well, an angel appeared to me. Yeah, that's why we're warned. Because <laughs> it happens. And it's not angels. Um, yeah, I mean, just the totality of her sin or iniquity being piled up and Fire, yeah. Any comments on that specifically? On it's kind of a almost a song that kind of uh, puts in paragraphs as if it's a poem or a psalm. Anything? Any comments on that? Yep, absolutely. You want to indulge? It'll it'll catch up. It'll catch up. Yeah. Well, and I'm just thinking of now what we're seeing in all our award ceremonies because of the, the Grammys. <laughs> sure. It's like, yeah. It was, he was Satan, and there were <laughs> half naked women in cages. And yeah. he come out as some <laughs> kind of sexual, I don't know what. It yeah, is. yeah. It's like everything. It, it's all weird. And then Eurovision is doing the same thing. Their award ceremony in Europe with whatever they do. Yeah, so yeah. It was all outwardly, in your face, demonic. Yeah, well, and, and and but I think the thing is about that is that should teach us. We take for granted knowing better, 
what does the world see? They see this as liberation. Yeah. They're like, we're freed from those darn Christians that have had control for so long, in recent history at least, right? That's how they see it. So, and, and so that's kind of the funny thing is they kind of jokingly, you know, I think I was reading his comments about dressing up as Satan, and, you know, it's kind of a joke to him, but it does, it's not, the, the symbol is not a joke. Well, how do I mean that? It stands for something that's not a joke, right? It is the liberation of the world. It is we should be able to seek whatever we want, seeking the pleasures we want. That's what it stands for, right? Um, and then you're thinking, gosh, you don't even know what you're doing dressing up like that. You think it's a joke, and it's real. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, going back again to chapter 17, I think we're chapter 18, I think we're just talking in detail about what happened to the woman, which is the great city. Yeah, yeah. And the great city was set on fire by the beast and his ten kings. They plundered it and then destroyed it. Yeah. And then in chapter 16, which we read, when that great earthquake occurs, I think this is after what we're reading here mm -hmm. with the woman the great city being destroyed then god does the coup de gras with splitting the city apart in yeah. two parts yeah you know actually a realization kind of to the point you brought up matt of okay well there's these false religions but they have morality well actually at times that's applied to christianity and by this i mean when it is preached not as the gospel in its purity, but as only morality. And the morality that whatever preacher or whatever church decides to focus on. And so in that way, I think we should embrace our responsibility of making sure we're preaching the gospel because no wonder people are doing what you know, we've described because all they see is uh, chains of morality of which they may not understand or want to follow. And they don't see the gospel. Now, that's not to say, I think some people hear the gospel and they do reject it. So that's not to say that people are uh, off scot-free. But uh, sadly, I think there's a, there's a truth behind it that people have seen Christianity only as, as uh, something to be caged by. And so kind of this, in more recent times, this freedom revival is so appealing. And they even see it as good. They think it's good and moral. And so that's the, and that's what's funny is because they're especially reacting, probably more so to <coughs> false Christianity, they then mockingly love using Satan. So you have people that want to oppose Christianity when it's being you, you know. So you have people setting up churches of Satan so that they can say, well, our religious freedom, you know, that's why I've seen that for abortion. They, they say, well, if it's a, if it's only a religious argument for abortion, then we're going to say our religion needs abortion to oppose it. And you're thinking, well. I get where you're coming from when, they, when that's when you think it's all about. Uh, likewise, you see <clears throat> Satan used as a symbol mocking Christianity, but that's, again, the sad thing is they've only viewed it as chains and they don't understand what they're now chaining themselves to. Ugh. But I, I, think, I think there is a responsibility for us in the church to make sure we're not setting up, that's stumbling blocks for people, right? When we're not presenting the gospel. <clears throat> A lot of people have been burned by the church in that way. And Lord have mercy on them, and Lord have mercy on us that we would not do this ever. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I don't know if you've seen some of the news on the internet, but over in Ohio, in elementary schools, they're starting Satan clubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is incredible. Right, right. This is incredible. It is. And I think that's kind of what I was getting at, where they're, they're setting this up in opposition. Um, and so whether it's, to me, again, the way I see it, Satan doesn't really care if we're worshiping him, as long as we're not worshiping God. Go after the woman of Babylon. Go ahead. Uh, if it leads us astray. So um, I, I do, that, that's just something I very much, as a pastor, but I'd encourage all of us as the church to make sure what, what are we standing for? Because I think that's how we answered the question Matt brought up about, what, well, what if they are being good people, though? Well, but what are they leading people towards? Um, apart from the gospel, you're either headed for pride or despair. There's no middle ground. You're going to end up one on one side or the other. Because you're going to think you're great and that you've done enough and you deserve heaven or you deserve to be enlightened or whatever. Or 
you're where a lot of people are utterly depressed, no hope. And maybe we should legalize, uh, you know, assisted suicide then because there's nothing, there's nothing here anyway. And that, so that's what happens you know, these religions, they seem good from a moral standpoint, but what, what good is morality if there's no hope anyway? Hope should be the reason for our morality. Uh, yeah, Tracy, you had your hand up. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Um, yeah, I know. Not too long I forgot the state of sin. The Afghan faith minister had the young baptism. Yeah, yeah. And they were talking about freeing you from yeah. the commandments yep. of the law. Yep. And which it does the exact opposite. But if we only preach law, right? Even if we try to mix the two, it just comes off as being still. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, that's why, especially in our Lutheran tradition, the idea of of preaching both law and gospel became such a big thing for us to make sure that we're not just preaching a lawless Christianity. Because then, why do you want to be a Christian anyway? Well, if it doesn't really matter, I don't need Jesus. I'm fine on my own. But also, if it's only law, then I don't really want Jesus because it doesn't seem very fun or good. So yeah, it's that's why we preach the full counsel of God. Absolutely, and pray that the Holy Spirit is at work, not just us preaching what we want to talk about. Uh, Diane, and then I'll come to you quick. It's also vice versa. You can't just preach the good news. Right, yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying, where if you only preach the good news, kind of like the ELCA as we kind of see it becoming only about love and good, well, but why would I be a part of that? I, I'm fine. I'm, I don't need that. You know, I can love apart from the church, right? No question. It's, it's easy to want to go to one side or the other because you don't want to preach people to hell through laws. But also, at some point, you realize, well, we have to actually believe something about morality. We can't just say love and let people go do whatever they want. Yes. So, as humans, we wrestle with that. We bounce back and forth. The God, God's word calls us to the discerning middle. And we're, and we're, we're guided by his word and the Holy Spirit's at work. Uh, Dave, please. Yeah. Well, from your reading this morning yeah. in the gospel... Satan does want us to worship him. Yeah. Well, He's yeah. The Lord Jesus, right. You know, I'll give you the world. Right. If you'll fall down before me and worship. Mm. Yeah, and then there is that aspect. So yeah, I, I I shouldn't say at all he doesn't want us to. Um, maybe what I would say to my point is what is what does he maybe do? He starts with the woman of Babylon. We go to her, but then what's really behind it? Yeah, with Jesus, he just goes straight to the punch. All right, going to go for the KO. I'll give you everything. Just worship me and be gone, Satan. Let's wrap it up here. Um, let us cling to the word and let it enlighten us, not us coming to it with what we think it ought to be, but let this word guide guide us through this world. It is... Um, it is something to take refuge in. It is something to give us hope. It is something to rebuke us and something to comfort us. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all. Great discussion. Thank you, Pastor. You bet.